Travis, would you come on up, please, sir? He rocks. I want to start by just asking you all a question. How many of you here are in, let's see, healthcare, uh, education, business, some other really cool field? Wow, not many of you like, like your field. Uh, how many of you here are students? couple of you. Let me rephrase that question. I don't think I, I got the response I wanted. How many of you here are lifelong learners? Okay, fantastic. Well, my name is Travis Allen. I am a college student at Kennesaw State University. Anybody know where that is? I, in Georgia, that's the response. I just get blanks everywhere else I go. So if you're not aware, uh, we are going to be about 30,000 students. Polytech is becoming part of our university. We get a football team next year, which is exciting. And uh, I've been a student there for about four years now. And today I really want to talk about becoming a mobile learner. And what that means to be a, a, a digital learner in today's education in today's world and I really want to I want to focus on three points I want to talk about my story I want to talk about my journey of why I'm in front of all of you today second I want to ask the question why as we begin to move in this direction with technology have we stopped to ask ourselves why and last I want to share with you three things I've learned along this journey that can change our world so, the journey. You see, I was not born in the same time period as some of you here today. I was born in the information age, and what I want you to do is walk in my shoes. Imagine what it's like to grow up in the information age. And I want to start from the very beginning to show you some of the technology that already existed before I was born. The Nintendo Game Boy in 1989. Anybody own one of these still? They're worth $1,000 on eBay last time I checked. The first cell phone in 1984 priced at $4,000. My journey began in 1991, and that's where it all began. And during the first decade of my life, these companies started shaping who I am today. Companies like Amazon, eBay, MSN, Google, Wikipedia, and many, many others. And they shaped and they formed who I am today. But looking at the second decade of my life, by the time I was 12 years old, I received my first computer. And at the age of 12, I was able to explore the world around me. I could go anywhere, and the possibilities were endless. A year later, I received my first cell phone, the Nokia Brick. And this is where my journey began as a mobile learner. Now, when I was 14, I played a lot of video games. Anyone here like to play video games? A couple of you. Anyone have kids here who like to play video games? Well, video games were a big part of uh, growing up, and I want to share a quick story. When I was 14 years old, I played the massive online role-playing games. These are the games where you're playing with millions of other players all over the world. And I played this one game called Star Wars Galaxies Online. And uh, iSchool Initiative is not the first organization I created. When I was 14, I created a virtual fake business inside this world. And after playing it for a year and a half, I became one of the wealthiest people in the game. And I had 30 and 40-year-olds working for my virtual company at age 14. Everything I learned through this game, I'm now applying to my everyday life today. So video games were a big part of growing up. And then when I was 16, I dove into the world of social media. Now, not only could I explore the world around me, but for absolutely free, I could share a message with the entire world. Now, this is one of the most powerful game changers that's shaping our society today, and yet most of us don't realize the power, especially our youth, don't realize the power that they have at their fingertips. And I'm going to come back to this point in just a moment. And then when I was 17 years old, I received my first smartphone. 
And I did everything on this device, from taking notes, to reading my books, to graphing calculators, you name it, I did it on this device. But you know, at age 17, I realized something, that my education was vastly different from my real-world experiences. And I want to highlight just a few things that I experienced growing up in the uh, information age going to school. In my high school, I had one of these laps. They were called computer laps. And, you know, really we would use this for word processing. And if we were lucky, occasionally Oregon Trail. <laughs> we didn't really see much of the Internet being used and almost no cell phones or mobile devices being used in the classroom. And my team and I, we created a list of grievances we experienced growing up. And I wanted to share some of those highlights with you. Students and learners cram and memorize for a test and then forget it the next day. Buy outdated textbooks and never, never open them. Are expected to learn to survive in the real world without experiencing the real world. Schools are bound to four walls and a desk. Are killing creativity from Sir Ken Robinson. And last, our current education system is built on an outdated model fails to account for the different learning style of today's digital natives, and fails to embrace mobile technology and new innovative teaching methods. Now, this is, this is a list of what I felt growing up, but we've come a long way since then. I graduated high school in 2009. We've come a long way since then. But I want to play a quick video for you that shows where we ranked against the rest of the world. Since the 1970s, U.S. schools have failed to keep pace with the rest of the world. Among 30 developed countries, we rank 25th in math and 21st in science. The top 5% of our students, our very best, rank 23rd out of 29 developed countries. In almost every category, we've fallen behind, except one. The same study looked at math skills and found in these eight countries, the USA ranked last, but when researchers asked the students how they felt they had done, did I get good marks in mathematics, kids from the USA ranked number one in confidence. Let me paint it one last way. America's education system is the Titanic. It is this huge industrial age model, and there's so much infrastructure in place that it's hard to steer directions. And the problem is we're headed straight for the information age, but there's an iceberg in our way. That iceberg represents the challenges that you and I face to get there. Often we think the problem is not enough technology. However, most of us in this room know that that's not quite the case. The core, the root of the problem, is ignorance. People not aware of the need for change, and most importantly, fear of change. Now, this fear of change I have seen across the board. It's not just education. It's any time change is occurring. The, the reason that it, it hinders is this great fear for change. Now, fear is a great motivator, one of the best motivators, in fact. And so, I believe that we need to change, go from a fear of change to a fear of what will happen if I don't change. And when we see that shift happen with education, with business, with many other verticals, we will start to see us move towards the information age. So this fear of change has been a core issue. So that is uh, my education, but I want to talk about what my real world experience was like. It was this idea of cell phones and the internet computers merging together. And to me, this is what mobile learning is all about. And so in 2009, I was, a, again, a, a senior in high school. And I was using my smartphone in my class one day to take notes. And, uh, of course, the policy, though, in my school district was, any guesses? No cell phones. And as I was taking notes above the desk next to my friend texting under the desk, 
my phone was taken up and given to the principal. The principal called my parents, and I was in trouble that day. Baffled, when I went home, I decided I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to share a message with the world to show how mobile technology could transform education. And so I turned to the only logical place, YouTube. And when I was 17, I created a YouTube video showing how one-to-one -one mobile learning would transform our education system. And I want to go ahead and play just the first minute of that video for you all. My name is Travis Allen. I'm a 17-year-old high school student at Whitewater High in Fayetteville, Georgia. I believe I have a solution to America's education problem, and I need your help. My high school is experiencing massive budget cuts, teachers are being let go, and classroom sizes are getting larger. Our public education system is broken, and it needs to be changed. I hope you will take a moment to watch this short PowerPoint presentation I have put together that answers the question, does technology belong in our classroom? You decide. Let me introduce you to the future of American education, the iSchool. The iSchool will be built on Apple's popular iTouch platform. The iTouch is a revolutionary handheld device that is capturing the imagination of people worldwide. With its easy to use touchscreen interface, it has set the standard for music, video, and third party applications. With the right plan, this simple device could change the face of public education. The idea is simple. Imagine a schoolroom with no books, no paper, no expensive copy machine, and no more number two pencils. Impossible, you say? So I'll go ahead and stop it there, but as I created this video, it began to go viral, and I started receiving emails from all over the world. And you know, after listening to the panel on makerspaces, I looked back on this time in my life, and I can't imagine what I could have done had I had access to a makerspace. More importantly, I was fortunate enough to have the ability, the technology, to build this video that led to all this creation. But if I didn't have that access, I can only imagine what something like a makerspace, what doors that would open to our young learners. And that's why I really, really thought it was just great to hear what they're doing with makerspaces. Now this video, as I said, began to go all over the world and I was getting emails. And from these emails, the following year I went to college and I created an organization called iSchool Initiative. Now, iSchool Initiative, we are all about empowering students to have a voice in education. Here we are, deciding the fate of our young learners, but have we stopped to ask ourselves what they want to see in the classroom? The other thing I loved about Makerspaces was bringing generations together. I know that my learning has been exponential because I have associated with a wide, diverse group of individuals. And so any opportunity to create that for our young learners I think is critical. But for me, an iSchool initiative, we wanted to empower students to have a voice in education. In addition to that, to that, we wanted to support teachers on using technology effectively. We realized when schools were using the technology, it was difficult to adopt and help incorporate to the classroom. So through this organization, our team has trained about 150,000 teachers on using technology effectively. We've been to about eight countries and uh, 42 different states to raise awareness and create excitement around our movement. But to continue with my story here, our approach to learn is this concept of find, filter, and apply. No longer do we see it as valuable to memorize and retain everything up here, but more so to have the ability to quickly find the right information and apply it to our everyday lives. So how can we equip our young learners with this ability to find, filter, and apply and become lifelong learners? And I just want to share a quick quote from the VP of Operations for Google, the person doing the hiring for Google. Here's what he said uh, when he's looking for people to hire. The number thing, one thing we look for is general cognitive ability. It's not IQ, it's learning ability. The ability to process on the fly. And so again, these skills are absolutely critical for our young learners to incorporate. And I think uh, what showcases this idea best is one of my favorite movies, The Matrix. 
And so I want to go ahead and play a quick clip from The Matrix. Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Operator. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. Hurry. Let's go. Maybe we're not quite that far, but we're close. But if this is the world in which we are headed, what does it mean for the way we teach? What does it mean for the way we learn? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves as we move forward. So find, filter, and apply. Again, to just continue with uh, my personal story, in 2011, I entered into a Google Young Minds competition. An international competition hosted by Google, where if you're between the ages of 18 and 24, to submit a one-minute YouTube video showing how you're changing the world. I had the privilege of being selected in 2011 and attended their Zeitgeist conference. And at this conference, I was able to meet people like uh, Larry Page, the CEO of Google, or Sir Richard Branson from uh, Virgin Mobile, Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post, Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas, Tony Hawk, the professional skateboarder, but the most interesting person I met by far, top left here, this is Peter, the creator of Angry Birds. And I, I loved meeting Peter because I, I was 19 at the time, I believe, and he told me this great story. He said that, you know, most people, they, they think he just became an instant millionaire overnight with Angry Birds, instant success. And he told me a completely different story. He told me Angry Birds was the 58th game his company ever made. 58th game. Now, that doesn't sound like overnight success to me. In fact, that sounds like he failed 57 times before finally becoming successful. And yet, this was a message that I desperately needed to hear as a 19-year-old entrepreneur. I always had this fear of failure, as many of my colleagues do as well, this, this genuine fear of going out there and failing at something. And to see successful people, and if you look at anyone, if you look at Michael Jordan and Einstein and all the stories, you will see a trail of failure behind anyone successful. And so I really enjoyed meeting Peter and hearing his message. In addition to that, uh, my team and I, we were invited to the White House to attend the Educational Data Palooza event. At this event, we learned that the question is no longer, does technology belong in our classroom? The question is, what, how do we use it? What do we do now that it's here? In 2013 alone, there were over 8 million tablets bought by school districts in the U.S. going into the classroom right now. So again, the reality is that these devices are here. It's about how do we engage our students with the technology and how do we help them create something with the technology. And, you know, what began as a YouTube video has now led us to going to the White House. And I think that in itself is a testament to the power of social media and technology. None of this would have been possible in any other time period. So I think it's really, really critical to use this technology and leverage it with our students. Now, in addition to that, we also have been going to a lot of places all over the world to share our thoughts. And uh, one place in particular we went to that I want to share a quick story with is uh, we went to Tanzania. And... I was really surprised at my experience here in Tanzania. They didn't have running water. They didn't have electricity. And yet every single one of the college students we worked with had a cell phone. Not only did they have a cell phone, but I was on a safari in the middle of nowhere. I was 10 feet away from a giraffe, and I pulled out my phone to take a picture of it, and I had full 3G service on my phone. While we're the Titanic, they're a sailboat, and they're headed straight for that information age. They're leapfrogging a lot of the infrastructure and technology that we have today. So it's a really cool experience to go to Tanzania. 
But what I want to, to mention is where this technology uh, and this initiative led us to recently. Uh, well, it started about two years ago. My team and I, we wanted to reach as many people as possible. And so at first we thought, what if we host a conference here in Georgia? We invite everyone we know. We quickly found out, as I'm sure some people in this room can attest to, that's very difficult to do. It's very expensive. And so we thought, why not be a conference on wheels? Why not take the show to the schools themselves? And so in 2012, my team and I raised $150,000 to live in a bus, nine guys and one girl, living in a bus for 45 days, traveling cross-country to share our message with anybody who would listen. So this is how we spent our summer that year. We started in Georgia, went all the way to California, up to New York, and back to Georgia again. And I've got to tell you a quick story here. When we were raising the money, $150,000 to launch this. It was four days before we were ready to go, and we were legally obligated to spend this $150,000. And four days before launch, we were $40,000 short of what we needed. And my team looks at me, we're like, what are we going to do? Are we going to take out a student loan? How are we going to afford this? And that same day, I met with President Papp at Kennesaw State University, I told him what we were doing. He looked at me and he said, how much do you need? I said, $40,000. And he wrote me a check that day. And it was at that moment that I realized I should have said I needed $60,000. <laughs> Might have paid for my college. But this tour was an absolutely amazing experience. Living, living in a bus, I don't know if that was amazing. But the experience of what we were creating and what we were doing to push education and inspire teachers and students and administrators in education was an absolutely awesome opportunity. In fact, my favorite stop along this first tour is the very last one. And it's, uh, it was in Georgia. And it was my old high school. The very high school that took my device up four years ago has now done a 180. They're a bring-your-own-device district. And this couldn't have come at a better time working with my old, older teachers because that same year, my little brother started his freshman year at that high school. And he had the ability to learn in ways that I would have loved to have had growing up. And so the reason I'm here today, the reason I'm sharing a message with you today is to create a better and brighter future for our students of today. Now, the following year, 2013, we realized two things. Uh, number one, living in a bus is a terrible idea. And number two, 45 days is not enough time to change the world. And so we set out with a new bus that we don't live in. It's uh, kind of like the Magic School Bus and Transformers merge. And uh, this bus, you, you press a button and it expands to twice its size. You can fit about 40 people in there and it showcases the mobile classroom experience. It's kind of like a makerspace on wheels in many ways. It's full of technology. It's full of different things you can use to create. And uh, we take this not for 45 days, but we went on a six-month trek cross-country to build excitement in education. And uh, that year, we went to uh, about 30 states and uh, presented to about 40,000 people uh, to share our message and go on the bus. And the following year, 2014, we have now launched a year-round tour. The bus, every week, goes to school districts to build excitement and motivate schools to reimagine learning. Now what I want to mention here is something that applies to all of us as we, as we look at the shift to digital in our world today. There are many barriers to, to help us to move forward and progress forward. And I think one of the biggest barriers often comes down to culture. And going back to that point of fear of change. And for us, we, we break people into three different categories, three different groups. You've probably seen this in every vertical. Your first type of person we call your sailboat. And these are those teachers, those leaders, those people who you don't even know what they're up to half the time because they're being so innovative. And they're the ones really leading the charge 
in this space. And your second type of teacher, we call your tugboats. And your tugboats are those individuals who will get there eventually, but they, they need a little tug. They need a little pull every now and again. Can anyone guess what your third type of group is? Your anchors. And your anchors are those that are rooted in fear, those that have that, that fear just completely stopping them from moving forward in whatever they're trying to do. And my, my question to you is whatever you're doing, whatever vertical, whatever industry you're in, who do you want your tugboats to follow? Because they will tie themselves to whoever, whoever you empower the most and whoever's louder at the end of the day. And so it's absolutely critical that whatever environment you're in, you find ways to empower your sailboats, to push them forward, and give support to your tugboats throughout that journey. What I have realized being in education and being in other spaces, that nobody often that many people don't like change. That fear of change is always there. And when I look at why they don't like change, one of the things that I've seen is nobody wants to be a pawn in the change. They want to be a part of the change. And that's the key difference between a movement and a, and a forced change is how to go from having someone feel like they're just a part, a pawn of it, and go more towards being a part of the creation, getting them involved and having them be the leaders in moving us forward to create that change. So for me specifically, I believe that in education, we have got to move that culture forward, and the rest will follow suit. Now, how do we do this? One of the number of ways we empower students and empower the sailboats is through a program we call iSchool Advocates. This is a student mentorship program where we select groups of high school students at districts we work with, and they go through a four-day mentorship program that focuses on public speaking, leadership, technology, and teamwork. And they meet with my team for four days, and, and we did this in South Carolina recently with 45 students, and it was absolutely the most inspiring four days of my life to be able to work with these young individuals. And what we task them with is at the end of the four days to create a project to change the world. You see, often we think and, and we often enforce this idea that our young people are the leaders of tomorrow. Well, in my opinion, that is the greatest insult you can ever give a young person. To imply that they don't have the ability or desire to change the world today, that they have to be the leaders tomorrow. And so we want to leave these students with a message that you can change the world at any age as long as you put the effort to do so and you move forward with that idea. So we wanted to challenge these students to change the world. Shortly after we, we went with this program, one of the teams came together and at the end of the four days they designed a logo. It looks oddly similar to our logo. They call themselves the three E's, Excite, Educate, and Engage, and their goal is to provide training for their teachers in their district on using technology effectively. Very similar to what we are doing ourselves, but in a very organic way, we were able to recreate ourselves within that district permanently, and that, that I believe, is how movements are created. That's how you can inspire people to go forward and create that change. So this has been my journey that's led to the birth and creation of the iSchool initiative. And I want to, to leave with a couple thoughts here. Number one, especially looking at education, the paradigm shift that I believe must happen. Right now, as technology is being integrated into the workforce, into schools, into wherever it might be, I'm finding that the focus is on the device. It's a very device-centric learning environment. And essentially what we're doing is learning about technology. It, there's a disconnect in classrooms. It's like, okay, kids, put away your tablet. We're going to start learning for the day. And where schools are starting to move towards is where we call a content-centric learning environment, where now we're learning from technology. And this is great. This is all about the, got to have the latest and greatest app, got to make sure, you know, we have all the cool gadgets and software and things on the devices, and it's really focused now on the content and the material. But where education must head is a student-centric learning environment, learning 
with technology. Technology becomes like oxygen. It's invisible. It's ubiquitous. It is simply the tool that's there to get us to create something at the end of the day. That is why it's there. It's a powerful tool and nothing more. And when we can focus on a student-centric learning environment, I believe that's when we will have a shift in our education. Now, I want to close out with, uh, I have one last video, but before I play that video, three things I've learned along this journey that can change our world. Number one, work hard, fail a lot, but learn more. My greatest fear since kindergarten all the way up till high school, my greatest fear has always been public speaking. I was the student in high school who said, I'll build the PowerPoint, you do the presentation. And I got through most of my career without ever having to get up in front of people. And when I went to college, one of my mentors, a professor, looked at me and said, if you're not willing to change, you'll never change anything. And he forced me up there on a stage. It was a room this big. A total of six people attended that session, uh, four of which were my college roommates. And I completely choked. I left halfway through my presentation. I couldn't, I couldn't even present in front of six people. But I realized quickly that I had to work really, really hard. You know, Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. I had to dedicate time and sweat and blood into something to make myself successful at it. So work hard, fail a lot, but learn more. Secondly, have a love, an absolute love and desire to learn. And what I mean by this is those who are passionate at being lifelong learners will be the game changers and the leaders in today's world. And here's why I believe this. Information, in my opinion, information has always equaled more power. The more information someone has, the more power they have. And it used to be that information cost a lot of money. Therefore, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and it was this vicious cycle of information being, being bought and delivered and turned into power. But I believe because of the internet, information is quickly approaching the value of zero. And that's a good thing. Because that means that technology and the internet is the great equalizer. That anyone will have the ability to learn, to create, and to grow as long as they have a passion to constantly pursue an education. And I'm not talking about a formal education. I'm talking about a lifelong learning mentality towards everything you do. So have a passion for learning. And last, and quite simply, lead the way. Often I, I get a lot of people who come up to me and say, I love what you're talking about, but my school will never think this way. Or my teachers aren't ready for this. Or my students can't handle that. And yet time and time again, all it took was one teacher, one student, one principal to defy the status quo and lead the way and show what is possible for the rest to follow. And I want to play a quick video on an amazing TED Talk on leadership. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. 
This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So to sum up, don't be afraid to be the shirtless dancing guy. Don't be afraid to be the first follower. Lead the way. Show others how it's possible. And I'll end with this last quote. When your passion and your purpose are greater than your fears and excuses, you will find a way. Thank you so much for your time today.